I am Dr. G, and we're here with Engaging Minds every week. We like to look at our world uh, from a deeper, more psychological point of view. And I like to bring up topics that have a lot of meaning to myself. And one of the things as a healthcare provider that I'm very interested in that I'm always researching is different trends that are happening within the healthcare industry. You know, we hear so many complaints all the time about people complaining about their insurance, but I also wanted to say that there's a lot of people out there, especially people that I'm about to bring on, that are trying to make a difference by being really what I call trendsetters in the field. So I'm going to bring them on right away, but first let me give them a brief introduction. We're going to have Dr. Rebecca Nelkin. She's a a urogynecologist, and she's going to explain to us what that is, so don't worry about it. I know a lot of people might not be clear. And then we have Alan Cole. He's the founder of Total Wellness. It's a corporate wellness company. We have Dr. Goats. He's an internist. He also does house calls with the Beverly Hills house call doc. That's who he is. And then we have Shannon Jackson. She's the founder of Grace Premier, which is a nursing concierge service. So as you can see, we got a great panel in front of us. They're going to talk to us about how they're trying to make a difference in their own industry and try to change things so they could better serve people like ourselves. So I'm going to start off with uh, Shannon Jackson. Shannon is a good friend of mine. She's the founder of Grace Premier Nursing. Uh, Shannon, why don't you explain to our audience what Grace Premier Nursing is? First of all, thank you for having us here today. It's a pleasure. Um, So concierge nursing is a patient-centric approach to providing, we don't even call them patients, actually we call them client services, where we actually set up customized programs as part of the healthcare team working in concert with their physicians and individualizing care for that patient. And it's actually bringing like a couture dress, a customized dress to the patient's home without the boundaries of restrictions, but it focuses on the patient's needs, goals, and expectation, and from a nursing aspect, whereby nursing by definition is um, about pain alleviation, support, uh, collaboration, advocacy, we're doing that one client at a time and working within that team approach and managing that care under that physician's plan of care. And what I love about what you do, and I'm going to mention to uh, to our audience that Shannon and I have worked together. I run a Concierge Detox LA with Dr. Damon Rask and we do a very similar approach to bringing detox to someone's home and the rehab someone's home. What I love about what you're doing is you also meet the individual individual psychological needs of someone and with all our guests you're going to see how we've integrated those kind of needs into the work that they do because once you meet those psychological needs you're also able to give someone peace of mind and that's so important when they're trying to heal themselves absolutely so i'm going to ask uh, dr goats uh, uh I, I first of all i want to thank you for coming on i know you're too busy it's my pleasure doing house calls but how did you get into uh doing house calls. I'm really curious about that and what makes your service unique? Um, Great question. I initially got into house calls because um, I was trained in internal medicine, but my philosophy, what I learned is um, uh, Hasidic mysticism. So a lot of what it talks about is uniting the spirit with the mind, with the heart and the body. And that uh, taking a one-sided approach of just looking at the body and just trying to heal the body without aligning those other three aspects that make us who we are as human beings, um, it's, a, um, it's, it's lacking. So, so that's what initially got me into this, this idea of bringing um, not only access and not only convenience, bringing it to the patient's home, but additionally integrating it, like what you were talking about earlier, with um, an approach of um, you know positive thinking affecting the the, the, the mental state of a patient um, or a client, as you said, or um, 
um, constantly bringing joy, uh, uh, trying to trying to um, make the heart as well aligned with the with the mind, and uh, for those who are who who uh, you know also want to to take a spiritual approach as well, bringing that into it. And, and you know what I love about that? There is this research that is coming out about uh, depression, and one of the things they're finding out is that at, in attachment theory, how we connect to the world, how we connect to people, will have a lot to do with, let's say, the course of depression. That it's not necessarily a cure, but could very influence uh, your ability to get better if you're creating positive attachments to people. So to me, that's very much a spiritual approach. And I, I, we're going to find out, you're going to see all of you guys. The reason I picked you all is you're all very similar and you don't know it yet. So, <laughs> and Dr. Nelkin, I want to welcome you to the show well, and uh, explain uh, to our audience what it is that you do. Okay, so urogynecology, another name for it is female pelvic medicine and reconstructive surgery. Uh, so I treat uh, women with any sort of pelvic floor issues. So most commonly urinary incontinence, pelvic organ prolapse. Um, and I think it's it's so interesting that it's really not, not known very well what this field is. And I think my mission is to kind of bring these issues out of the shadows. And I think uh, we're in a time when women are really talking more about their symptoms. Um, this is... These are such prevalent symptoms. One in three women suffer from some sort of pelvic floor symptoms. and um, But they really underreport them to their primary care physicians. And so this results in them not really even knowing what treatment options are available. To Do you them. feel that maybe the underreporting might be uh, a certain amount of shame that some women may have about their experience, so it's difficult for them to talk about it? Uh, I think it's partly shame and embarrassment. Right. I think there's also a big component of, I, I see women every day in my practice telling me they've been suffering for years with urinary incontinence because they just thought it was a normal part of getting older and they didn't realize there was anything that could be done about it. I think that's the biggest part is that as a society, we're not really educating people that there are treatment options. Uh, yeah, you know, I'm gonna, that's really interesting because maybe... Well, maybe that's part of it, because maybe as a society, there's a certain level of shame that we carry around socially that we're, it's difficult for us to talk. But as we see the hashtag Me Too movement and Absolutely. stuff, we're definitely going to see, hopefully, more women coming into your office that need to be treated. And um, Alan, welcome to the show. Good evening. This is Alan. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, we can hear you. And uh, I'll let our audience know that you're calling in from Nebraska. And uh, I know that you do uh, corporate training and you encompass a lot of the work that we're talking about. So I wonder if you could explain it to our audience what it is, what it is exactly that you do. Well, I'll kind of start with corporate wellness because uh, that's the first thing people ask me. What, what do you do? Um, uh, corporate wellness has been around for a long time. Um, it's kind of uh, evolved of late using a lot of technology. And there's a hundreds of thousands of companies probably across the planet that are using technology to try to engage people uh, in different ways. But uh, it gets down to uh, what some of the other panelists have said that uh, sometimes it's not, it's much simpler than people make it seem, but you have to find that unique thing that connects with an individual and not look at it from just exercise and nutrition um, everybody's unique, and so when when you look at corporate wellness, you there's no one size fits all. And our company tries to use positive uh, reinforcement, um, give them something that they did right, rather than trying to say, "Here's all the things you did wrong. Uh, here's your cholesterol's high, your blood pressure's high, you're overweight, um, your BMI's high, all those different factors that we look at, and then they feel bad." And then they feel like, well, they can't do anything about it. So it's leading with the positive, finding a ways that connect with each individual, and then making that a corp, and then working with companies to make a corporate culture so that employees, as many employees as possible, find that unique connection to make their lives healthier and better. 
So I, I was going to actually ask Dr. Goats, when you're working with some, we got a minute left, so you're going to have to talk quickly, <laughs> then we're going to have time after the commercials. When you're trying to, and I'm going to ask everyone this question too, when you're trying to look for that connection that Alan is talking about, uh, how do you go about doing it? Because I know for me as a psychologist, if I don't have that connection in the first few sessions, I usually can't do any therapy. So I don't necessarily care if I talk about movies or theater or sports, you know, I'm just trying to get the person to trust me. So I wonder what your methodology is in trying to get that trust, because without trust, I don't think you can have any real healing. Absolutely. I think that there's a, there's, there's a lot of aspects to that. What I like to touch on is... Um, <laughs> and we're going to go to commercials in a second. <laughs> is uh, giving, the, giving the patient time, giving the client time, <laughs> not, uh, and, um, um, and, and listening and, and showing the person that you care. That's a perfect way for us to break to commercials. So if you're looking for a caring team, this is the show that you got to listen to. These are what I call disruptors, and we're going to find out what that word means. You know, one of the questions I got from people when I told them what we were doing is they wanted a little bit more detail. They wanted to try to figure out what exactly uh, do some of these guests do. So I'm going to start with Shannon. If someone uses your service and they want concierge nurse, Nursing service. What does what do some of the first steps look like, and how does it evolve in treatment? So there's multiple ways to gain access to us. One, clients can call us, or potential clients can call us directly. Um, also, we've gotten referrals from hospitals where hospitals have ha had people inquire and maybe someone is familiar with our practice or a physician has a patient that they're treating and the client has expressed that they want more expansive health care support. So not just a physician, but want other ancillary supports. At that point, however, that point of entry into our service, uh, an RN case manager uh, would go out and meet with the client and either the client support system oftentimes is more than just the client themselves talk about what the needs and concerns are and go through what expectations and goals are because it's truly customized as to what it can be done and if it's a referral from a physician or a referral from a outside support system collaborating with them in that process yeah and I do want to mention that since we've collaborated on some of the cases one of the things I think that was so rewarding for me is I learned so much about the medical side about that constant collaboration yes. that we had and I grew a lot as a psychologist and many times you would ask me also psychological questions so you could better your treatment absolutely so that collaborative part is such a big part of what you do and I think to me, I think that's what makes you a trendsetter is that uh, it's so dimensional, your approach. Very much so. Um, nursing, physicians, psychologists, dietitians, uh, we work collectively with the entire team on behalf of the client. And I think the client feels it. They uh, uh, appreciate it. And having that update and all of us actually at one time being on the same page is very, very rewarding to see because the outcomes are real and they're uh, in real time and effective. Yeah, I think they, they are. And I, I do want to stress that, that that's, I, I believe, as I look at each of you, what makes you a trendsetter is that collaboration that you offer with people. Um, you know, Dr. Goats, I was going to ask you, it's interesting to me when you talk about the spiritual side of what you do, does someone have to be spiritual to actually use your services or how does... Or do they have to uphold to a certain spiritual practice? I was just curious how you're a trendsetter and how that's unique and how you integrate it with medical care. Um, a person who is open um, and has that kind of mindset oftentimes will gravitate towards us, will often gravitate towards us. But uh, it doesn't mean that someone who's not into that uh, doesn't come. And, um, and I, we have a lot of patients who we go to their home and we end up being, uh, on, on a skeletal level, a concierge medicine service. On the other hand, you know, what we, what we really like to do is, is be in preventative care. Our, um, we're always pushing for preventative care, for looking for ways to encourage our patients 
to take care of themselves before it gets to become a problem and become curative care. So when we go when we go into a patient's home, normally the doctor that's assigned to a patient uh, or to a client, they develop a relationship where that is their doctor. They have access. They have telephone access to the doctor. They have uh, you know oftentimes they're texting back and forth. They're calling. They're able to directly speak to their doctor. The doctor will go to their home, assess them there. And when you're in someone's home, it's a it's a you're you're taking it to a whole new level. You're not going to be able to to gain uh, um, what you learn in one home visit. It will probably take you know, um, many, multiple visits in an office. So I'm going to comment on that because that's been my experience with my concierge work too, is that as a psychologist coming into someone's home, really, <laughs> I see Dr. Nelkins <laughs> going, yeah, I got that one. Uh, I learned so much in, you know, the first five minutes about their environment. Mm -hmm. And so to be able to apply that to the work is extremely rewarding. Um, I'm going to ask Dr. Nelkin too, you know, in, uh, in the work that you do, when someone first comes to see you, how do you lay out a treatment plan? What does that look like? Well, the first thing I do is really start by having an open conversation with my patients. And I think oftentimes this is maybe the first time that this patient has really opened up about these, you know, private and intimate issues. And it might be the first time that anyone has asked her about her sex life or her urinary incontinence. So, um, once we've had that discussion, I think um, I really see myself as a resource for the patient and I really like to lay out for her what the treatment options are that are available to her. So rather than necessarily just, you know, prescribing something and, and expecting her to adhere to it, I really like to lay out all all the options that we have available. It it really varies because I see such a, a range of, of symptoms. People are depends if they're seeing me for stress incontinence, I might be, you know, offering them a surgical treatment. Um, if they're seeing me for urgency incontinence, I have medications. I what's really right. amazing is in the ten years since I've been in practice, I used to have only one class of medications to offer patients for urgency and continence. And now I'm able to offer them two different classes of medications. We have Botox injections available to them. We have nerve stimulation that we can do in the office or an implant. So the point is that there really are a, a really a variety of options. And I really like to empower my patients um, by having And I, I love that word that you said about yeah. empowerment. That's what I was yeah. thinking that all our guests are doing is what I got from what you're saying from as a psychologist is you work pretty hard to create a relationship with someone and once that relationship is established, a lot can happen. And that, when I think of trendsetters in, in the medical field, that, that, that form of relationship, that form of attachment is so important to have. And, and like I said, from there, it's so many things could evolve and uh, treatments couldn't be different in integrating all different types of services. Absolutely. I, yeah, absolutely. Alan, I was going to ask you a question. Um, in how do you, like, how do you choose what program to work with certain companies? And I'm, it's a two-part question. And does, do you ever offer it privately? Does someone have to be part of a corporation to use your service? Okay, I think we might have uh, lost Alan there, but um, we're going to get him right back. But I'm going to hold on to that commercial. I'm going to ask uh, that uh, question and ask people to uh, remind me of that when we get Alan back on the line. That sometimes happens. Um, so... What in, uh, what inspire? I'm going to ask people because you know there's uh, so many different things that we could do uh, and choose in our life uh, as professionals. And I'm going to ask everyone a little bit of a personal question, ladies first. I'm going to start with Dr. Nelkin. Put you back. Why? What inspired you to do this work? Because I think it's important for our patients to hear the human side of of our physicians and our caretakers. I think I've really, um, my goal has always been back to the empowerment to, to empower women by educating them about their own bodies. And uh, I'll bring it back to what you said about the Me Too movement. It really is such an amazing time to be in this field because the 
um, that hashtag really spills over to everything. And I think women are, you know, no longer willing to kind of suffer in silence with their symptoms. And we've really started a dialogue or a conversation in society about um, women's pelvic floor symptoms. And I think that's driven industry to invest in new treatment options. And that's just increase the conversation so um no i I think it's amazing alan uh i want to just make sure you're back on the line are you there yeah i'm here um i have a few questions for you but i'm going to start with the question that we're on right now there's a lot of things that people could choose to do and getting a service a lot of times we don't get to know that human side of an individual and i'm wondering what inspired you to do this work that you do and bring health care to corporations uh that's a good question actually uh well uh back when i was a kid and after uh went to university worked for a family business that we primarily serve nursing homes uh, and home health care patients. And I, I, would, I started off delivering medications and oxygen and uh, saw people not in the best uh, health of their lives. And, you know, some shouldn't have been in those, that situation. And so uh, that kind of inspired me to get into the wellness arena in some areas. So corporate wellness seemed like, like a natural fit, you know, get people when they're young, uh, working age, um, work with companies to help create a better culture in the workplace. So that was kind of where my inspiration came from. All of the people that I have on have been talking about the personalized care that when they approach a patient or a client, they get to know them first. They establish a relationship. There has to be a level of trust there. And then from that, almost miracles can happen because once you form an attachment with someone, and again, there's a level of trust, then you could start to build a program together. That's what I think healthcare needs to go and is happening in a way that psychologists build uh, certain trends is, you know, I, a lot of times people will come up to me and say, well, how long do you think it's going to take me to heal myself? And I said, I don't know. You know, it's going to take as long as it's going to take, but we're going to do it together. And that mutuality is what's so important. So if you're going out there and you're meeting a physician, think of it like going or anyone in healthcare, think of it like going on a first date. You've got a former relationship. And you know what? Eventually, if you can't, maybe that's not the right person for you, but you've got to be able to have that trust. And that's what I'm hearing from all our call our guests is that trust is so important. Uh, Alan, I wanted to ask you a question. Actually, all of us here (laughs) wanted to ask you a question. Do you have to be part of a corporation to be able to use your services? Uh, No, not totally. Uh, A lot of a lot of companies involve the spouses or significant others in the wellness program, so that's kind of dependent upon the company. But I think I think that answers your question a little bit. But uh, typically, we're involved in we're connected in some way or another to the, the employer group, uh, but it could be the spouse. And and what does a wellness program look like? I mean, can you give us a, an example so we can get a, have a more specific idea? Well, there's not there there's not one there's not one <laughs> one one wellness program. Uh, every company is uh, unique. Uh, what works for one company would not necessarily work for the other. I've I've been into some of the newer technology companies, um, including Google when they started up and had a couple of employees. To Uber, to companies that have been around for a long time, like uh, Cardinal Health. Uh, so you have to look at the culture. You have to look at the employees. What 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 their work situation is? Um, can they get off breaks? Uh, what's the work environment? Do they have any place they can walk outside when it's a nice day? Um, you know the 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 management plays a big part. It's it's a whole 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 gambit of things that you have to look at, and a lot of times companies don't even know where to start. So usually uh, we try to bring keep it simple we have a lot of things that just help employees engage on a positive 
uh, way, and then and from there you can build a lot of uh, good things. But it, you have to start somewhere, and companies usually don't even know where to start. Uh, but there's a lot of comp- good companies out there that have great wellness programs that have worked for a long time. It just, it's just uh, a lot of companies just need a little bit of help to get to that point. And um, a little bit of inspiration to be able to get to that point. You mentioned something about right. technology that I think is interesting, and I know that I want to ask some of our uh, health trendsetters how they've incorporated some technology into the work that they do. So I'm going to start with Shannon Jackson. I know you've got some interesting ways that patients can act or clients can actually follow their health care when they're working with Grace Premier. So with Grace Premier, we actually have an electronic EMR system that um, we invested in uh, to make us unique. Um, uh, most EMR systems are geared towards home health or hospice, but ours is custom for what we do. Explain to our audience what so EMR is. So electronic medical record system. Great. And what it is is that the, the client themselves have, client or the, the client's advocates on their side of who's their support system have access to seeing a plan of care that's evolving right it's dynamic because it's ongoing and contact their schedule their preferences be able to communicate directly and have access to that as well as all the health care providers that's on the team so not only do we have live documentation being done in the home but we can upload their labs upload records so for physicians that may want to write orders we can give them access where they can write orders onto the system or if we drew labs and they were faxed to us. We can fax those results over or share documents up on there. So everything can be live uh, because it's web-based and it's secure and it's um, health-protected information. So we're very, very proud of that. I think that's amazing. Again, that's how you've created this collaboration and you've applied it to technology. And can we apply that? uh, How about yourself, Dr. Goetz? Uh, In your house call work, have you applied any kind of technology that patients can have access to? I think it's a, the question even goes broader than that. Good. that. Why are we even in the patient's home? If you look at, <laughs> if you look at where we're at right now, uh, yeah. right now we're, we're expecting everything in the home from you know, Google Express to Amazon. Uh, everything, everything is slowly coming into the comforts of the home. So I, th- I feel like that's where healthcare has gone. So you know, we also have our own EMR that, we, that allows us to connect with the patient and the patient can send messages through there. But oftentimes they don't, they don't really need that because they're contacting the physician directly. Um, that being said, it allows them to communicate with our staff and to be able to see their results uh, on a real t- on a real time basis, um, so certainly I, I feel like uh, what we're all doing is just a natural evolution of um, of of technology as a whole. You know, I can't, when you said everything's going back into the home, I remember being a kid where actually I had my doctor mm-hmm. did house calls, my pediatrician, and. Um, why do you, I'm going to ask you, why do you think it's going back in that direction, back into the home? Um, I think, I think, uh, we're, in your opinion. Yeah, yeah. I think we're moving into, I think we're, we are prioritizing um, comforts. And, and uh, one of the most uncomfortable thing is sitting inside of a uh, cold doctor's, uh, doctor's waiting room uh, with those old magazines uh, and, uh, you know, t- twiddling your thumbs and waiting to hear from the doctor. Sometimes, uh, if I'm running late to see a, to see a client, they're not uncomfortable. They're not, uh, you know, Jerry Seinfeld has a joke about uh, being in one waiting room and then you have to go to another waiting room and you don't know how many waiting rooms you have until you see the doctor and then you're not wearing pants. The doctor is wearing <laughs> right. pants and uh, uh, it's, yeah, all, it's uncomfortable. So we, we try to bring uh, comfort where the patient, the, the, the client really is, is, um, starts out in a safe place. I love that idea of a safe place. And when you said that about comfort, I know as a professional, and so many times I'm reluctant to want to go to a doctor because it's not so much that I don't want to see the doctor. I don't want to wait in the waiting room for an hour (laughs) before the doctor. I got a life to live, too. And I know as a psychologist, God forbid, I'm like three minutes late with a patient. (laughs) They go crazy in the waiting room. But I've actually left physicians because... I've sat there and waited over an hour, um, and it, it, you know, once or twice I understand there are emergencies, but if it becomes routine, it makes me feel like, uh, well, one is I'm busy, and I know a lot of our 
our, our listeners are busy people, so they want to have a certain level of respect when they come to see a doctor. So I love the, that's such an interesting concept that it offers a certain amount of respect and comfort in the home. And right. go ahead, Shannon. And if I can just yeah, um, absolutely. chime in on that for a minute. It actually, in the beginning, in that introductory phase, you're asking what are their expectations? Putting the client first. And I think that's what makes the big difference. It's not you're valuing actively listening and making sure that's incorporated in the delivery of services to them. What are you expecting out of this? What are your goals and expectations? You know, if, if I walked into a doctor's office and he said that to me, other than great, obviously great medical care, I would actually be really excited about working with that person because I would feel like they actually want to work with me. Well, they care. Or and that they care. Your, and your needs and expectations are being incorporated into what medically is required or mentally or physically required in there. And I think that it is so important today because... If the client or the patient, the words are used interchangeably here, is at the focus and we're taking a holistic approach, mental, physical, spiritual, and all of that, the outcomes are tremendous. You know, I, I'm going to ask Dr. Nelkin to chime in in a, a moment, but I did want to comment on that. I was thinking uh, when you said that about... Uh, someone I worked with a long time ago and this couple were really at each other's throat uh, not a good relationship and I used to think that and, and one of the 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 man in the relationship was not in good health and so many times I used to think I wonder if she he just got a little bit more love uh, and I'm not taking away, you know, the science of healthcare. But if he just got a little bit more love and caring, would his body relax enough to maybe heal with that? Whether you call it a spiritual energy or healing energy, enter his system. And I don't, I don't know if I have a concrete answer, but it's something I believe in, and I think it's so important. I see Dr. Nelkin. <laughs> I want you to chime in and okay, share yeah. with us your feelings about what we're saying. I agree absolutely and even though you know my subspecialty is very narrowly focused you know on the bladder and the pelvic floor uh, I think it's so important to have uh, this multimodality approach and I um, always work very closely with pelvic floor physical therapists and psychologists nutritionists and um, I really believe you know a lot of women hold all their tension in their pelvic floor and it leads to symptoms such as urinary frequency, urgency, bladder pain, pain with sex. And, um, you know, I tell my patients there's not one pill that's going to be a magic bullet that's going to fix all this. It's really going to take the work of fixing the underlying muscle tension, whether that We're going to have to stop in a minute for commercial. We're going to get back to that right after the commercials <laughs> and talk to you some more. So I'm just going to end on this feeling that maybe a little bit love and care can uh, help someone heal a great deal. In, in And, of course, great medical care with it. A lot of people who are out there that are saying health care has gotten so cold and distant and, you know, physicians and nurses and doctors and corporate people are just interested in uh, money. If you hear our panel, you'll understand that it goes beyond that, that there are definitely people out there that want to heal and want to help and can form and do that by starting to form very powerful relationships with the people that they're working with. So uh, that's something I just, you know, have always felt. And it's so great for me to hear it coming from medical professionals, too, because as psychologists, we can't do anything until we create a relationship. But Dr. Nelkin, at the break, we were discussing the issue of technology and how you use it in your own practice. So I'm wondering if you could elaborate on that. Yeah, so technology has kind of transformed my practice in a slightly different way um, as far as treatment options that we're able to offer the patient. Um, I'll give the example of vaginal dryness, which is a result of decreased estrogen around the time of menopause. Um, it causes symptoms of uh, frequent urination, um, painful sex, and discomfort. Uh, and it used to be treated uh, with vaginal estrogen, which is a hormone. Um, and 
not all patients want to use hormones. And now what has been developed is in office treatments uh, with CO2 lasers and with radio frequency that actually treat these vaginal dryness symptoms non-hormonally. Uh, and they actually seem to be addressing some urinary incontinence um, and some prolapse issues non-surgically. So it's bringing us to a place of less invasive treatment options, uh, non-hormonal, non-surgical. Uh, and even more recently, now we have an at-home device which uses LED that the patients can actually use themselves intravaginally, this LED light, to treat their own symptoms of urinary frequency, urgency, incontinence, some of the vaginal dryness. So talk about bringing, bringing it into the comfort I, I of I just want you to know all, uh, yes, exactly, <laughs> all, all of our health care professionals here. You know, we are on radio so people can't see it. They're all nodding. Yeah, yeah, I got that. I understand that. So, um, well, thank you for sharing that information. And again, yeah. if you're out there and this is an issue, you know, don't have any level of shame or hesitancy. Be open to your doctor. And you can hear that once you are open and have that trust. There's so many options that are available and that's exciting for a lot of women to hear. Um, you know, I was going to ask uh, Shannon uh, Jackson, you know, how do you see uh, concierge nursing services evolving in the future? Like if you were to see your company in a few years from now, um, would it, how would it change? How would it evolve? I'm just curious. I think expanding. Um, uh, I think when more and more people become aware that there are alternative options that will help them in prevention and managing uh, their care and health by having a core team that's with them to support that in a variety of ways, it's going to catch on like the next big thing. Um, hospitals today, which we all, I'm sure, can agree, it's a lot of research out there with hospital-acquired affections continuing to rise. People that stay in the hospitals are getting sicker, and that's why there's a lot of education and different things. So to be able to come home and have those services brought to you at home with your team that knows you, your goals, your services, and help coordinate your care and plan that is just remarkable to be able to do. And I think the outcomes of quality of life are extended. I have one quick story sure, sure. to tell um, a couple of years ago, um, a gentleman had his wife that was at Cedars, and um, she was coming home for service, and she had not walked, and all of a sudden got very sick and was being discharged, and was interviewing companies, and at the time, I was working with the company, and not I had started my own, but was managing that case, and with the services that we brought in the home with the physician, the psychological support, the nutrition, and the round-the-clock care that we provided, and the nursing case management. The wife went from not walking to being able to walk, to be able to get back in the car and go to their home in Palm Springs, and she had not done that. She had a G-tube. The G-tube was removed. He said to me, and actually wrote a letter of accommodation that said that he strongly believes that if his wife was put in a assisted living or skilled nursing facility, she would not be there. You know, I, I see Dr. Goats nodding his head, and so I'm going to ask was, that yeah, was what to respond to that, too. Say, this is why I do it. And that warms you to know that you are making a difference, one life, one client, one family at a time. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's very heartwarming to hear you say that. And I, I, I'm going to go, and I want to thank you for sharing that story. It's really a wonderful story. I see Dr. Goats nodding his head. So I'm going to ask him to respond to, to two questions. One is if you could respond to what Shannon said, and also how do you see your work very similar to Shannon's as a physician uh, in home evolving in the future. It ties back to what you were saying about relationships. There's a, one of the most famous studies that's out there is about is the Harvard study that they've been doing for over 75 years looking at what affects happiness. And what they came to realize is that what affects happiness and subsequently longevity is relationships and uh, meaningful relationships. So we see that, and I'm sure every single person, it's not a question, you, you know, you were speaking earlier about is it true? Is it not true? I don't think it's even a question anymore. I think you're absolutely right. I think it, um, when people have relationships that they deem meaningful, 
it leads to them to have uh, longevity. So it goes back to Shan's story, what she's saying about uh, the the client saw that they cared. The, not only that, the husband clearly cared. And um, the the lady, whether or not she herself felt that there was a reason to continue, she saw that there were people around her who, who loved her, cared for her, and wanted her to continue to live. And and um, just the power of the mind, you can see right right there, is I, I, I'll shake my head yes, because I agree. I think if that lady was in the hospital, I mean, I don't know, but my, my guess would be that, that uh, she would have a decreased life expectancy as opposed to being in the home, uh, having such a care team around them. Uh, so I, I think it goes without, without question that, re, that relationships and the way that we view our relationships uh, affect uh, our, our physical health and longevity. Um, it, I'm going to share a story too. When you were saying that, I was thinking about, um, you know, if, uh, about three years ago, to, almost to the day my my dad passed away, and um, it was so interesting because when I, I when I went to visit him, there were so many times that I would see these older people in rooms and really by themselves, and sometimes I think maybe. I started to get the feeling that some of these people had actually outlived people that cared about them, that they were one of the few people, you know, that were still alive. And I had this desire and sometimes I I just go in and start talking to them and I could just see like, you know, their faces line up and I knew like intuitively how important that connection was. Now, I don't know how much I influenced, you know, their health, but I have a feeling at least I made them a little more comfortable. And um, I, I think that's so important. And I don't want to lose that in our technology and the work that we do as healthcare providers and sometimes as scientists, that you also have to bring that humanness to the work that you do. I'm going to ask Alan quickly. Alan, um, we have a couple of minutes left. So how do you bring that warmth and, warmth and humanness to the corporate world and the work that you do? Well, back to kind of your last question about technology and, and the future. Sure. Uh, that's, you know, we, we use technology in a very educational way. At, when we're doing a screening at a workplace, we sit down with the person. We do a bunch of uh, different tests. Um, we give them results right away. If they do labs, we can do more extensive results. We give them status updates that, you know, we receive your the lab has got your results. You'll have it by the next day. They can go into a uh, log into a portal and they can see some basic information that helps them navigate their life a little bit better. Um, and then uh, you mentioned about things in the future. Uh, a lot of the focus is on uh, educating people on men- mental uh, wellness. So focusing on that is kind of the future. And then back to your question, we'll restate your question again uh, about how we make that. Alan, I'm going to have to actually, uh, you know what, I know, I, I just want everyone to know that uh, I know we're, we're ending the show, but I think they can okay. tell from who you are that you're a very warm and loving, caring person. So I want to thank you for being right. on the show. And I do want to remind our listeners that if you're looking for a private concierge firm, nursing owned and operated, you've heard Shannon speak tonight. She's with Grace Premier. Her uh, contact information is 323 364 Seven two two three. You can visit her website at gracepremier.com. And of course, she's always here with the spirit of excellence. I want to thank our guests for coming on the show. You've all been really wonderful. I think our audience, I know our audience now can now hear how interconnected all the work that we do and how important it is to find healthcare providers that actually care about you and want to form, form positive relationships. I'm Dr. G. We'll be back next week. The number is 1-800-222-5222. If you want to call me or email me with any questions, feel free to do so. And uh, we'll catch you next week.